So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, the techniques of building an 18th century home. I've kind of uh, sorted out 1750 to 1800. That's the period that I like the best. Um, the technology did not change much in those 50 years. And um, we've got lots of examples of that period here in, in Orange County and, and also adjoining counties. Um, so let me gauge the audience here a little bit. You're, you're driving down the road and you're in, say, you're in Louisa County, Spotsylvania County, Orange County, and you see a little house perched up on the hill. What screams to you all that that's an early house and in this case, an 18th century house. What would you expect to see? Don't everybody holler at once. Exterior chimney. Exterior chimneys. Plural, probably. Okay, very good. Because you have to have heat. There wasn't any central heat. Exterior chimneys, brick or stone or a combination of the two. Okay, what else? Two up, two down. Probably a hall and parlor. Hall and parlor to, uh, in uh, a divided bedchamber with a center staircase over the partition. That's what I would expect to see. All right, what else? A steep roof pitch. Very good. That, it's usually 12 and 12. Um, that, to me, that screams 18th century. Um, what else? Narrow windows. Narrow windows. Gra glass was precious. Not only was it precious, but it came over here on the boat um, in 1750. So, um, very good. Probably 6 over 9, 9 over 6, maybe 12 over 12, um, depending on, on where you are. Um, Anything else? Those are some, some very good examples. No closets. <clears throat> no closets. <laughs> we, 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 we took down and moved a house in uh, northeast North Carolina that had one little closet, and it was manufactured, I mean, it was a built in, and it had about six cut nails on a wooden ledger, and that was it. A big house, 2,000 square feet. Um, they didn't, they didn't need the closets. Lots of outbuildings. That, that's actually on the landscape. That's not part of the house, but you would expect to see lots of outbuildings. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the foundation um, and go to the shakes on the roof and um, try to explain the technique, uh, the material, and the tools that are used in, in these um, parts of building a house. <clears throat> so starting off with um, the foundation, you mentioned um, basements or cellars. That's going to get you down to clay if you're digging the basement, obviously. You're going to be digging down to undisturbed soil. So that's, that's key. Um, if, you're, if you're not digging a basement, you're still going to get down to something undisturbed, clay, uh, get through all that organic matter to start laying your bricks um, or stone. Um, so let's say we've dug down and now we, we need some bricks. So what are we going to do about bricks? These are, these are really well-made examples of brick molds, mortise and tenon, um, this pretty jazzy wire handle. It's all pegged together. Um, so you're going you're gonna to get down to some clay. Fortunately, in this part of the country, we've got some of the, the best brick-making soil there is in the world. Uh, General Shale Webster, Webster Brick, for a long time, produced uh, millions, I guess, bricks uh, right here in the county. So you're going to get the clay, and, and I'm, I'm going to just kind of go quickly through these processes because I um, could spend a lot of time and get bogged down. but. Um, so you're, you're going you're to pack these with clay that's been mixed with water. 
and um, strike them level at the top. And then you're going to find a place probably near a shade tree. Now this is on the building site or close to. Um, not on the building site, but close to the building site. Then you're going to find a shady spot and you're going to turn these over and you're going to line them up out in the sun so that they can get um, firm enough so that you can handle them. So you, you pack them full of clay that's been mixed with some water, strike them level, take them over, put them in the shade. Now you've got probably thousands of bricks, depending on the size of the house, the need, thousands of bricks, um, air drying, sun drying. It's during that time when these bricks are laid out there that you get imprints. Here's one of a dog. I've got a sheep, a cat, another dog. So they, these bricks would stay out there depending on the weather, um, days certainly, maybe weeks, um, and they're exposed to, uh, I found one in northeast North Carolina had an infant's footprint about that long in it. That's my favorite. Um, so most of these are going to be oversized. Um, pretty easy to see that that one's oversized. Uh, this one is from Petersburg, Virginia. Um, but they come in all shapes and sizes. I've got bricks here that you would uh, expect to see in a foundation or a chimney. Um, uh, there's one brick. This one's from the Madison County Courthouse. Um, probably not supposed to have it, but um, it, it was in the dumpster, so a, a decorative brick that, that may have gone on the top of a wall. All of these are handmade brick. Um, oftentimes you'll see bricks with numbers written in. This one is, this one is 424. Has nothing to do with the date of the building. Um, but there were that many bricks in the lot. So I don't know enough about colonial reimbursement for workers to know whether you were paid for um, that number of bricks or if that's just a way of keeping count. But um, we often see numbers scribbled in the brick. So the brick are, takes a lot of labor. Um, it's, it's, it's very labor intensive. Um, so once the bricks have air dried, now you've got um, the opportunity to build a kiln and you build the kiln with the green bricks, the unfired bricks. So you build an oven shaped kiln and it's wood fired and um, it takes a lot of wood because you have to get a really high heat. And the brick that are the closest to the flame will be dark. some of them even black. Um, so this one is well fired. Or you'll get salmon brick um, that were on the exterior of the kiln. These would be used on the interior of the wall. So you'd have probably three bricks uh, thick foundation. Um, and they would be laid either in a flimit during this period, either a Flemish bond, which I'll demonstrate. So these are called uh, headers, and these are called stretchers. So English bond would be a row of headers and then a row of stretchers. Flemish bond is Stretcher, header, stretcher, excuse me. That, that would be Flemish bond. And um, you'll see, especially in some early churches, um, 
you'll see where they use glazed headers. They're black, and it makes a checkerboard pattern on the um, on the facade. Um, this was done to tie the building together. It's much like uh, stacking hay bales. You're, you're going to be uh, tying these brick together, and that that is the strength of the wall because the only other thing you have tying that wall together is probably at best lime base mortar, a mixture of lime and sand water. Um, in many cases, it was clay. Um, so it's that it's that bond as it's referred to, Flemish bond, uh, English bond, that, that's where the strength in the wall is. Um, I'm not a mason, but um, I'll do till a mason shows up. Um, so you've got your, you've got your foundation laid. Um, maybe it's on a cellar, maybe not. Um, the next thing you're going to do is you need some, some timber. Um, and the process for that is, um, dates back to the, to the Romans. Um, it's basically taking a round tree and making a hewn timber out of it um, so that it can now be used uh, in the building process. And um, th this is actually a floor joist from Hebron Valley, um, but it'll 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 suffice for a for a timber force. Um, before I go too much farther, I want to point out that. Uh, these, these people building these buildings, the intimacy between the tools and the materials um, was unlike it is today. Um, we show up to build something now with a 16-foot job site trailer, and it's packed full of power tools. Um, these guys would have shown up on the job with a tool tray, maybe with a lid on it, um, and I'll, I'll go through some of these tools in just a minute, but the level of craftsmanship I can't say enough about, um, and, it, and it has to do with that intimacy that I'm referring to, is in many cases the same person fells the tree that nails that finished, the finished clapboard on the roof. Um, whereas today, you know, we, we order our material and um, we might run it through a planer, um, but that link between um, or, or that that intimacy is is not there um, like it was during the 18th century. So we're going to start out with a round tree. Still got the bark on. It's a log. They were they were worked green and they were put up green. Now there is a drying period between felling them, working them all up, test fitting them, uh, numbering them, and then getting everybody together to put it up. So there is that, but there's no intentional period of drying um, for, for a few reasons. Um, most, of, most of the timber for these early houses was cut in the winter. Um, the jury's still out on the whole sap rising, whether that's advantageous, disadvantageous or not. But um, one of the reasons was we had a lot more snow. They were able to, with, with um, livestock, pull the logs out of the woods. A lot better working conditions, um, cooler, colder um, for doing this heavy uh, timber work. So um, you might say, well, how do you know that? One reason I can tell you is every log cabin that we move, whether it's in Indiana, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, still got the bark on the logs. So they hew the outsides and leave the top and bottom, traditional Appalachian style log building. But the bark is fast to that um, tree, to that log. Um, the only way that can happen is if you cut it in the winter. You know, the, the saying, that guy's tight as bark on a tree in the dead of winter. Maybe that's a Virginia thing, Phil, I don't know. But anyway, 
the bark sticks to the log in the, in the winter. Um, in the spring, it peels off. And when we take these log cabins down, um, it's the best example I can give you, the, the bark is, is, is fast to the log. So um, we're going we're gonna to cut a log, we're going to fell it in the, tr in the woods, probably with a, with a, a felling axe. And we're going to get it to a space where we can uh, cut it to length. And we're going to um, pop chalk lines for the length of the log. So we're going to If you've got a round log, we're going to get two parallel lines just like this on this end of the log where you've, you've cut the log off. You're going to get two parallel lines. You go to the other end, you're going to get two parallel lines. You're going to take your draw knife and you're going to skin the bark off of the top right where the chalk line's going. You're going to skin that bark off of the top and you're going to pop those chalk lines for the length of the log. Now you've got this tree with most of the bark on it with two chalk lines. Now the chalk line, this is a really early example, could be as early as 18th century, but a handmade uh, chalk line. For the, for the medium, you're going to use either a, a chunk of chalk or a piece of charcoal. So you're going to stretch that uh, line, the length of the tree, you're going to snap your line. So you've got two parallel lines. Then you're going to roll your log over and you're going to do the same thing. You're going to skin it with the draw knife and you're going to pop those lines again. So now you've got four lines going the length of the tree defining this timber that you're going to be hewing. Then you're going to take your axe, felling axe, the same one you cut the tree down with, and all along the length of that log, using your chalk lines as gauge lines, you're going to chuck, chop V's the whole length of the log. You're going to look just like that, the whole length of the log. Then you're going to come back with your felling axe and you're going to knock those chunks out. So now you have a roughly two-sided timber, two-sided, and then the bark still on the, uh, on the top and bottom. Now you're going to roll it over. You're going to pop, pop your chalk lines. You're going to cut your V's. Then you're going to knock those chunks out. That's where you get the ax marks for hewing, for scoring. So now you've got a four-sided, roughly four-sided um, hewn timber that will now be used for sills. Um, it will be used for uh, corner posts. It will be used for the studs in the walls. Um, if you'll look at this, uh, this is called a, a hog trough corner, and if you lay it on its side, it, it looks somewhat like a hog trough. Um, if you've got some initials behind your name, then you'll probably call it a guttered corner. Um, but but in, the, in the building trade, we call it a hog trough corner. Now that's one piece of wood. So it would have been hewn square, and then it would have been chopped out. The, the part that's, that appears to, that is at right angles would have been chopped out to leave that void in the middle. I would venture to say that most of the houses in that 1750 to 1800 range are going to have hog trough corners. And the reason for that configuration is, and I'll, I'll show you. <clears throat> so if this is sitting in the corner of the house, and you have a wall radiating out this way, a wall this way, you'll have um, a diagonal brace. That's called a mortise and tenon. And that brace is going to go to the sill, that big timber that we just chopped out with an ax. That's going to that's going to go to the sill, and then all along the wall there are going to be studs, three and a half by four and a half studs all the way down the length until you get to a door or window opening, and then you'll have another post, and then the studs pick up after that. 
The reason for all that is the next step is you're going to be putting up a wooden lath and it needs to plane out it needs to plane out in that wall so there's it's no accident that these are the same thickness because they have to be on the same plane so that that's a hog trough corner and um, that particular one is from south south side um, it's yellow pine and I'll take just a minute to, to talk about uh, the species of lumber that would have been used here in, in the Piedmont. The, the first and foremost is yellow pine, and in this part of the country, uh, the premier wood would have come from shortleaf pine, um, one of our native pines. Um, you often hear the term heart pine, and um, we, don't, we don't have, heart pine didn't grow in Orange County, Virginia, because when you say heart pine, and this is splitting hairs, but, um, so be it. When you say heart pine, that means it's longleaf pine. Longleaf pine does not grow north of, say, Chesapeake. Um, but our native pine, shortleaf pine, which this is a, an example of it, is almost as good. Um, didn't reach the size. You know, in, in the deep south, the, the longleaf pine grew like, literally like a stand of corn. Um, it was these monocultures, huge monocultures that had never been cut, the virgin stuff. And um, so the, the yellow, shortleaf pine is, is going to be the, the, the material that's used the most in these early houses. American chestnut, especially closer to the mountains, it, it was used uh, in Orange County because it grew in Orange County. There's some of it in the... Um, attic at Montpelier. Um, of course, it's, it's extinct now, but and that, that would have been um, a wood that it would have been used uh, in applications where it was going to meet the weather. Tulip poplar, um, which we've got the best tulip poplar in the world growing in this thick Davids, deep Davidson soil. Um, tulip poplar was uh, definitely a go-to wood in this period of time. Um, a better example of it is let me, if you can see that, that green I just cut this before we came out uh, this afternoon that's the heartwood of, of tulip poplar. Um, that was a floor joist from 18th century floor joist from Hebron Valley. And then the other is oak, uh, white and red oak, which uh, we have quite a bit of in this part of the country, uh, a good quality. Um, so that covers yellow pine, red and white oak, tulip poplar, American chestnut. Those would have been the, the predominant woods um, in the building of the house. Of course, when you get inside um, for decorative things, you're going to have walnut and cherry and things like that, but for the for the uh, construction of the home, it would have been these four. De determining the age of a house um, has a lot to do with tool marks, for one thing. Um, people are always asking me, you know, how old's my house, and and I've been told it's 200 years old, and you go up in the attic and here's all these circle saw marks in the in the rafters and um, top plates and in the and you, you 
it's it's not you know you know it's it's not because the circle saw wasn't invented or in this area till about 1840 but um, it's really important to to for me uh, in what I do to pay particular attention to tool marks um, each of these tools makes 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 a mark that's unique to them um, that that uh, scoring that you see on that uh, piece of timber right there is done with a felling axe and the next tool that you would use would be the, the broad axe and that would be a finishing tool um, that would get the the uh, timber to the desired dimension um, so this was a finishing tool it wouldn't be a finishing tool for interior work but it would be a finishing tool for um, um, heavy timber another pretty distinctive tool mark is and it looks kind of like a, a washboard or corrugated is a scrub plane and that leaves um, well as I said a, sort of a, a corrugated look and it was this is a 19th century example but 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 they were made in also in the 18th century and it has a uh, the iron is convex um, instead of square and it, that's what leaves that um, that washboard type look you'll see it on the back of uh, early china presses uh, furniture that's um, been made in a shop you'll see the uh, the corrugated um, tool mark left by a scrub plane one of my favorite tool mark stories is um, we were moving a house from uh, north northeast north carolina um, hereford county up to spotsylvania it was a uh, 1812 a big plantation house 12 foot ceilings on the first floor, 10 foot ceilings on the second floor, just a grand house that um, tornado came through, pulled the roof off of it, and the owners weren't gonna fix it. They were gonna uh, remove it. So, so we're staying down there, um, getting this house ready to move, and a um, little place called Como, North Carolina. And I'm on the second floor. This is a, about 18, 10, 1812 house. Um, I'm on the second floor removing plaster and lath. So I've got a mattock or a grubbing hoe, and I'm pulling this. This stuff off the walls, literally by the truckload. Um, tens of thousands of pieces. Matter of fact, most of this house, we saved the lath, which is hand riven or hand split and it went to uh, Montpelier when they did the restoration. So we were able to give them two um, uh, landscape trailers full of riven lath. Um, so I'm up there on the second floor with my, with my mattock pulling this plaster and lath off and I look up and s looking squarely in my face is a waffle head print of a hammer that y'all probably not gonna lose any sleep over that are you but I lost a lot because a waffle head hammer this is called a California framer and it's got a head on it that looks just like a waffle and it is to I think to get a little more surface area so that it bites the nail a little better framers use them people uh, building decks use them so 20th century hammer, 20th century tw and 21st century um, waffle head. So there I am, second floor of this house, undisturbed plaster, 1812, the genuine articles, never been molested, never been taken off. It was, it was riven lath and original plaster. Pull it off. Y'all, you probably can't see this, but I, I made an imprint on the, uh, on this. Anyway, this waffle head mark was looking me right in the face. 
So I said, oh, no, that can't be. It just can't be. So that bothered me terribly. I lost a lot of sleep over that. And um, at the time we were moving this house from North East, Northeast North Carolina to Fredericksburg, we were going to be moving Litchfield, which was right here in the county, for Andy and Audrey. And Andy was waiting on me, and he, he got a little restless, which he's prone to do anyway. And um, he, he and Audrey started taking the plaster and lad out of the house to buy some time. So he calls me one day and says, Craig, you got to come by and look at all these tools I found in the void that's created when you put plaster on both sides of a partition wall. So you got a row of studs, you got plaster, you got plaster, it creates a void. So all of these tools were in that void. Now these are 18, the house probably started about 18, 18, 18, 19, finished about 18, 20, something like that. Um, these, these tools are Sheffield steel. They're imported from England. That's a big deal to, you know, you don't lose tools. That whole box of tools was right in the house somewhere. So, and he says, you got to come look at my tools. So I, I, I went over there to look at his tools and I looked through them and, and he handed me this. This is a lathe hatchet. So if you're applying lathe in a house, rather than stop to saw, uh, this is kind of a two in one tool. You're hammering the lath nails with the, with the pole end, and then you're cutting your length um, of the lath with the hatchet part. When I look on the back side of that 1820 Sheffield steel lath hatchet, and what do you reckon I saw? A waffle head. Now that was a thank you Jesus moment right there. I had lost a lot of, I had no idea, I just knew that Waffle head hammers were 19th century. So tool marks are very, very important. So let's pick up where we left off. The corner posts, the studs, the sills. We're working our way on, it's probably a story and a half house um, with a little box winder staircase that goes over the partition. Um, and the next thing we need, we need some floor joists. So one of these four-sided hewn timbers that we have laying around because they've been processed in the woods, drugged to the job site with an oxen, or be an oxen, right, Bill? Or, or a horse or a mule. Um, now you need some, now you got these big old timbers, but now you need some four by eights for floor joists. That's a four by eight. So this is a pit saw, uh, an, uh, an early one, a framed pit saw that would, you'd either build, you'd, you'd either build scaffolding, put your four-sided hewn timber up there, or you'd dig a pit. One man's on top, one man's on the bottom. Um, and you're standing as you're sawing So I'm in the bottom of the pit. I've got a big brim hat on for the sawdust falling, and all day long I'm doing this. And the guy above me, either on scaffold or I'm in a pit, he's standing on the timber following a struck line, either charcoal or chalk as we talked about before. He's standing on the timber on the other end of that doing this. Remember the importance of tool marks. So you go in a house and uh, somebody says my house is 200 years old and the first thing I start looking for is pit saw kerfs. Um, and the way you can set, tell a pit saw kerf is the later saws were um, water powered. So it was a fixed blade hooked to a grist mill and it would saw just like this, and, and the carriage would move the wood to the blade, just like this. 
So there was no change in that kerf or that scratch that the, that the, um, that the sash saw makes, the water-powered saw. But if it's a pit saw, it's just like if you're, if you're cutting with a hand saw. You know, you start like this, and then you go like this, and then you're always changing the, the pitch of the saw. No different with a pit saw. You're standing on the timber like this, and then you get close to your, so you step back. Now you're sawing like this. So this, this is, a, this is a, an example of pit sawn lumber. Um, you'll see that the, the kerf pitch or angle changes. I've got another example over here. The kerf pitch or ang angle changes, and also when they get real close to the end, instead of sawing right to the end, now this is a 16-foot board that, that, that's now like this because you're almost to the end of it. So that's split off. You just take the board and you go, and it pops. So that's why, that's why it goes from sawing to split. And by the way, this, this is a really special piece of wood. I mean, to, to have this example here to, to, to show it, it's the only one I've ever seen like that. So anyway, that's, that's pit sawing. So now we, we need some floor joists. And so I'm going to take that timber and I'm going to saw it in four different pieces. And it's, it's going to be this dimension, four by eight. So you walk into the cellar of this house that they say is 200 years old, and you look up, and one side of this floor joist that is running horizontal over your head, one side of it is hewn, axe cut, just like that. The other side is sawn. You look at the next one, and both sides are sawn. And you look at the next one, and this side is sawn, and the other side is hewn. So what they've done is they've taken that four-sided hewn timber, and they've made three joists out of it. Got a hewn face on each outside, and the one in the middle has got two sawn faces, and, and the I know this is very confusing, but anyway, so you have a mixture of sawn and hewn, and the, the, the pitch of the saw is going like this, and maybe along the way you've seen a few hand-forged nails, so then you're thinking, this may be a 200-year-old house. Um, so the, the tool marks are critical in determining the age of the house. That's, that's one of the indicators that's, that's critical. Um, so we get up to the we get up to the rafters. Now we need some sheathing, where we're going to do the same thing to saw one inch boards out of these hewn pieces. And I've got an example of a piece of 18th century um, roof sheathing right here. So I know it's 18th century. It was a 1734 house um, near Blackstone, Virginia. Interesting thing is, so this is what, if you walk up in the attic, this is the face that you're looking at. This is the face that the shakes or wooden shingles are nailed to. Interesting thing about this is at least two generations of wooden shingles have been nailed to this piece of wood because the first generation were blacksmith made they would have been the uh, 1734 build. Um, and then probably 30 years later, the next set of shingles was nailed on here, and they're nailed on with cut nails, manufactured nails. Um, nails that you could, at that point, buy by the pound. Um, so there's a combination of of hand forged, blacksmith made, shop made, whatever, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, and it's um, and it's um, pit sawn. 
So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting piece of wood as well. So now you need um, 10,000 shakes. Um, and the way you'd go about that would be to cut either white oak These examples that I have up here uh, are either white oak or chestnut or yellow pine, and I think that's it. Red cedar, Red cedar doesn't rive well. It's a really long-lasting, it saws well, but to, to rive it with a fro, or split. To, to, to split it out with the fro and mallet just be tough because of the knots. And so these would have been split out of, of blocks of uh, white oak, um, yellow pine, American chestnut. Just think of splitting kindling and splitting kindling intentionally to get these out with the aid of that fro. And the, the fro is not a really sharp tool, um, but the, you, you've got the, the handle for leverage, and that's, what, that's, what, that's how you split them out. So you start it with the mallet into the block of wood, and using the uh, handle for leverage, you, you split out the shakes. And then they need to be dressed with a draw knife. Um, this tool. And they're tapered. And they'll, they'll either be round butt, also called fish scale, or, or square butt. But you'll see the same shake whether no matter where you are, but it'll either be square butt or round butt, and usually 18 inches long, and usually one single fastener in each one. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about fasteners, because all this stuff that you're creating, you've got to You've got to now install it. So 1750 to 1800, most of the nails are going to be blacksmith made. Um, rose head, they're often called, um, in different lengths. Um, we've, we've had them made at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, different blacksmiths around still make them. The, um, the advantage of them is they're soft, so they're easily formed. Um, but that, that can also be a disadvantage when you're um, driving them into wood, maybe or knots, or tough wood, or very dry wood. Here's a pretty good example of what they'll do. This was a piece of flooring, um, oak flooring, from a early house that we disassembled and moved. And that one hit a knot, and you see what it did. It just made a big, big question mark. Um, but you can, you can use that to your advantage in that, say you are building a, uh, a door, that you have vertical pieces, and then you want some horizontal pieces to, to tie it in. It's called a batten door, um, a very traditional door during this period. And so you drive this nail through the through the the vertical pieces into the batten and now you can clinch them. You can actually bend this nail. Um, it's you everybody's heard the term dead as a doornail. Well that's that's the deadening process of a nail when you clinch it, you're deadening it. So that's that's where that term dead as a doornail comes from. Um, you can't do that with the later manufactured nails, the cut nails um, that, that came along uh, that you would buy by the pound wherever. 
But um, so these, these, these cut nails, or excuse me, these hand forged nails were, are a really good indicator of the age of a house. Now, if you find one or two, you can't base the age of the house on one or two nails because nails were precious. They, they saved nails for generations. So you have to look at the whole picture uh, to determine whether that's the, the fastener that was used during the construction of the house. So rosehead nails, good indication of a 18th century house. Screws uh, that were made, also blacksmith made, um, before 1840, they didn't have a point on them, which I know might not seem like that makes no sense, but they did, they were all square tips. So that's another indicator. Again, you can't pull one screw out of a, a door hinge and declare that this house is pre-1840. I would say that if you went to both floors, pulled them, you know, one out of each door, and it's a pretty good indication that, that maybe that, that house is, um, would, would be pre-1840. Another pretty good indicator is hardware. Um, these are cast hinges, which you'll see used um, in the 18th century. Uh, most of these would have been imported. That's, a, that's an H hinge that, that is also blacksmith made. Uh, th this is a, a shutter dog. Uh, and these are also shutter dogs, both of these from 18th century homes. All of these things that I'm holding, except for the hinge, uh, would have been blacksmith made and could be indicators of, of an uh, 18th century home. In all of the mortise and tenon um, joints, you'll find a peg. And, um, they're often called tree nails, um, but they would be made, most of them out of locust, uh, some of them out of white oak, some out of yellow pine. There's a, a basket of them up here that you can, can take a look at. So starting at the roof, the, the peak of the roof rafters would have been um, pegged, mortise and tenon and pegged, um, and all of the framing for diagonal braces, for posts going into plates and sills. They would also be uh, pegged together. And I had to So that's, that's the basic arrangement right there. Um, no mechanical fasteners, no, no metal fasteners. Um, the, basically the whole house, except for flooring and trim, uh, would have been put together with um, pegs. Um, I wanted to show you one more artifact. So you're, you're laying the flooring. This is new flooring, but it is heart pine, longleaf pine, resawn. So you're, you've got your floor joists in, and now you're laying your flooring across the room. And oftentimes when we take up flooring, we see these, we see these holes for the length of the, of the floor joists. They'll be maybe you know, three in this one and two in the next one and five in the next one. You see these holes just randomly. And so what's going on there is during the original build, during the installation of the flooring, let's say we're coming across the room with our flooring and we get right here and this stuff's tongue and groove. So we can't quite get 
this tongue and groove tight. There's a bow in it or something like that. So what we would do is, I found these in uh, Kinderhook, Virginia, right on the green Madison line. It was an 1840 house. But you see those holes. Well, this is an 18th century floor joist, so I know you see them in the 18th century as well. So I found these in the cavity. I found these in the cavity between the plastered ceiling of the downstairs and uh, the, the cavity that the floor joist makes between that and the ceiling of the uh, down below. So what I'm going to do is, if I can't get my flooring to tighten up, then I'm going to take my auger and I'm going to bore a hole right here. And I'm going to stick that peg in there. Now, now the flooring is laid up to here. So you got plenty to push against. It's all nailed off. But this one stubborn piece right here is giving me a little trouble. It won't quite close up. So then I put that peg in there, which is dogwood, and I drive that, I drive that wedge between the peg and my flooring, and it closes that piece of flooring up. So while it has tension on it, then I nail it off. Pretty cool, huh, Floyd? Um, anyway, that was a pretty cool moment, too, finding, finding these things. They could have just as easily tossed them out the window. Um, and I'm almost done. The, the people that built these early houses, I mentioned the, um, the intimacy with the tools and the materials, but they really knew what wood went where or what wood to use in each application. There's, that's not accidental that that's dogwood. Dogwood is a very dense, hard um, wood, and they knew that it was going, even for something as simple as this, they knew it was going to take a lot of wear and tear. So they used dogwood. Um, these tools that Andy found, the tools that Andy found in the wall, that handle is ironwood. And I know it because of the bark. To be that specific, you have to go, this only grows in creek bottoms and places like that. So you have to be very, very intentional. And there's a reason for it. They, they knew, and that head is locust. I mean, they just knew. It was, it was because of this understanding, this working with it every day, knowing their tools, um, knowing what species of wood goes where, um, it fascinates me. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's an indication of their knowledge and their skill level. You got all these parts cut for your house, laying out everywhere. So you've cut them and you fit them. You've taken your, you've taken your chisel and you've made the, the mortise and you've made your tenons, and then you take your chisel and you fit everything together. You, you try it in, in the, you try the tenon in the mortise that it's going in, and it fits. You take your chisel and your mallet, and you make a Roman numeral on both pieces. So now, they, now you have corresponding pieces with the same Roman numeral. They use Roman numerals because Everything's angular. You don't take a scribe and try to go against that grain to make a, a two like that. You make, you make the two like that. That's your two. So um, these houses are full of these Roman numerals. And so you, you, you fit all these parts and pieces. And then uh, when you get the gang together, have the big spread of food and you got 30 people there to put the house up, that's, uh, then you don't have to stop and fit everything because you know it's already fit. And so the, 
the Roman numerals, which are so important, were made with hammer and mallet. They were made with a, this is off of a piece of flooring. They were made with a little gouge that looks like um, the same tool you'd use to shell corn, except it had a really tight little um, curved blade on it. And you could, you could do like that and make these, make these Roman numerals. I don't know if you all can see that or not. So, so either a hammer and mallet, that little gouge, or a saw. This is a rafter, um, number, number eight. And it would have had a corresponding eight um, that would have already been fit. And uh, the fact that it's a rafter, it would have had a mortise and tenon at the top and ready to peg. So um, Roman numerals very, very um, important in the building of these early houses. I'm not going to say any more. Timber, uh, balloon construction goes from, it's later, for one thing. Litchfield was timber frame. The core of the house was timber frame. The addition, later additions were um, balloon construction. There are smaller members. Because it's later, it's, everything is sawn. And all of the members go from top plate to sill. What else, Floyd? Maclura pomifera. It's it's whew, it's a great wood. Um, the Indians called it Bodhi Ark, the wood of the bow. It was imported here for fence rows. You know, it's got that great big fruit. Um, it's it's our hardest, heaviest native wood. Um, I made I made our kitchen knives handles out of a set of kitchen knives. It's, it's, it, it, it has no pier as far as wear. If you were going to put, make sled runners or slide runners. Eating the houses more challenging? Well, very good question. Um, there was a lot of that simply because it took so much energy to, to, to make the pieces. So <clears throat> we'll often see when we take the plaster off, Mortises where we took, we took a, moved a house from Amherst last summer that we opened up the walls and, and I mean, there's parts and pieces everywhere from an earlier house. The, uh, the corner posts on the first floor were hog trough corners. Corner posts on the second floor, they just had extended them, were one piece square. Um, there were post framing windows that were diagonal braces in the first build. And I know that because I don't care where we're working on a house, uh, the carpenters, the first generation carpenters are gonna cut a step. If you can envision, if you can envision this diagonal brace going to the sill on that plane right there, those carpenters are gonna take their saw, that's convenient because there's a saw cut there already. They're going to take their saw and they're going to make a cut. They're going to make a cut and then they're going to take their hatchet and they're going to chop right through here. And they're going to make a little step. Every house in this, every early house has got them. And that's to step up. So that this, this diagonal brace is going to have a step cut in it. Well, this, this house in Amherst, I can still see the window had a post on either side and they had steps cut in them, but they were vertical. So they were diagonal braces in, in their first build. So the flooring, of course, was precious because it took so much labor. It had to be dry, really dry. So since I've been doing this, I have seen flooring uh, square edge just butted. I have seen it with oak pegs that long, size of your pinky, every 12 inches in lieu of a tongue and groove on the same plane as the tongue and groove. Of course, tongue and groove 
But the most interesting thing to me is about this early flooring is they could conceivably lay a one inch board beside a two inch board and the only difference is the two inch board where it hit the floor joist they would chop an inch out and you you when you take the plaster and lad down you look up in the ceiling the bottoms of the flooring are and i meant to bring a uh, an example of that so when we were rebuilding litchfield um we kept a And this is the tool that you cut that wood out with, a foot adds. Um, so you could literally put a one inch board beside a two inch board, but everywhere where it went across the joist, you just have to chop that inch out. So yeah, that's a good question, Garland. All the time, it's crazy. And when you consider that most of it was very resinous, yellow pine, um, in attic spaces. I bet you I have seen that, and I mean a lot of material charred, I bet you I've seen it 15, 20 times. Have no idea how they got it out, but see it all the time. You know, you see it uh, in front of fireplaces, little, little divots, you know, where an ember sat and but I'm talking about um, roof sheathing, you know, timbers, um, charred. Can't imagine how they got it out, especially knowing what the condition of the wood was. We use the word technology like it came out of Silicon Valley, but it applies to this as well, that technology that came from England, that came from Germany, um, you know, the, the exterior chimney versus the interior chimney. Um, oh, there's lots of e examples of the difference in English and Germanic building, but Joseph Campbell is buying a circle saw blade in 1842. And he was, I think, the first. And you know, he was in the uh, railroad tie business. You can imagine, because these guys, these poor guys out here in the countryside, they're out there chopping these railroad ties with, with foot ads and a broad axe. Here's Joseph Campbell cranking up that steam engine, and you know he had the corner on the market in 1842. So yeah, that, that's that's the the same one right there on Campbell Road. Yeah.